Living in York is a fantastic experience. It's a beautiful city to live in. It has over 2,000 years of history. It's had an important place in Britain for all that period and it's continued to develop and reinvent itself. I work here at the University of York in the Department of Chemistry and even in just the last five years the Department of Chemistry has completely redeveloped itself and become a fantastic place to do research. What I want to tell you about today is an aspect of chemistry that perhaps you don't think about as chemistry. And I want to think about a product that's intimately connected with the city of York, and that's chocolate. York has been a chocolate city since the 1800s, with two big companies setting up as rivals in chocolate manufacture. We had Roundtree, famous for the Kit Kat, and Terry's, famous for the chocolate orange. Interestingly, both those companies were set up by Quakers, in the same way that Cadbury's in Birmingham and Fry in Bristol were set up by Quakers. It's no coincidence that Quakers were doing this. First of all, as non-conformists, they weren't allowed to study at university because they weren't members of an established religion. And so many Quakers went into business. Secondly, Quakers didn't agree with alcohol. And that's where the Quakers' love of chocolate came in because cocoa was seen as an excellent alternative, hot drinking chocolate, to alcohol. Quick potted history of the York chocolate business. Roundtree was taken over by Nestle. They still exist here in the city of York. It's their UK headquarters for research and development and manufacture. The Kit Kat production line is still going strong. Terry's were taken over by Souchard and in spite of promises to keep Terry's in York they were relocated into Central Europe and there is no more production of the chocolate orange here in York. Chocolate carries on to the modern era here in York. Monk Bar chocolates are an amazing supplier of beautiful chocolates. The Cocoa House do savoury dishes which involve chocolate in the cooking as well as a whole range of chocolate desserts and there is recently opened a chocolate museum that you can visit and you can find out lots more about the history of chocolate and how it connects with the history of the city of York. However, I want to talk about the science of chocolate. Why is it that I love chocolate so much? Why do I sometimes, and many people sometimes, feel they have almost an addiction to chocolate? Could it be something chemical that gets us hooked? Well, I think this chemical is an interesting place to start looking for addiction to chocolate. Phenyl ethyl amine. Looking at the structure, the name becomes obvious. A phenyl group, an ethyl group, and an amine group. If we look at the structure of this molecule and compare it to important chemicals in your brain, dopamine, serotonin, and others, phenylethylamine looks very similar. And those chemicals in the brain, they make you feel good, they make you feel aroused, they make you feel in love. So could it be that phenylethylamine is acting like those chemicals in your brain? As a chemist, we'd say, can phenylethylamine, can it act as an agonist? Can it act just like those chemicals and switch on circuitry in your brain? Well, if we look at lots of drugs, they all have structures like phenylethylamine, so perhaps it's not so far-fetched. However, if you eat chocolate, phenylethylamine is absorbed through your stomach and it's metabolized very rapidly in the liver. It's very unlikely that any of that active ingredient can actually get into your brain and act as an agonist, act like dopamine, serotonin, and so on. So it seems very unlikely that the feel-good factor of chocolate is down to this little chemical, even though it looks so much like all these drugs. Let's think about the second interesting chemical in chocolate that could be responsible for why it makes us feel good, and that's theobromine. Here we're looking at the structure of theobromine, and if we compare the structure to caffeine, you'll see that they're very similar to one another. And caffeine is known to have all sorts of effects. It stimulates you. It makes you feel more upbeat. Caffeine works because it looks a bit like adenosine. Now adenosine is a compound that your brain uses to slow itself down. It's a bit like a brake on your brain. Because caffeine looks like adenosine, it can actually block the activity of adenosine. We call that acting as an antagonist. So the presence of caffeine stops the adenosine from slowing you down and that leaves you sped up. It leaves you in this stimulated state. So can theobromine do the same as caffeine? Can it stimulate you? Well, the answer is it can. And theobromine is known to be active in chocolate, but it does stimulate you nowhere near as much as caffeine. 
But the thing it stimulates the most, somewhat differently to caffeine, is your heart, your circulatory system. And it's known that theobromine is good for your heart. You might ask why caffeine and theobromine have slightly different effects. And the reason is that they have very slightly different chemical structures. And those precise details actually really, really matter. And they're the kind of things we study in chemistry. Understanding why every atom in the structure has the effect that it has on the behaviour of that molecule. So what's the third interesting component of chocolate that we could consider? Perhaps the simplest of all and the best known of all, and that's sugar. There's been a recent study that suggests that sugar is as addictive as crack cocaine. And the evidence for this was looking at the response of people to sugar and the response of people to cocaine in a brain scanner. And they showed that very similar patterns of brain activity resulted from eating sugar or from taking cocaine. In fact, sugar gave a greater response in the brain. Does that mean sugar itself is an addictive chemical? Well, it's very interesting because if you expose people to an artificial sweetener, they have exactly the same response. It switches on all that circuitry in just the same way that sugar does. And as a chemist, that tells me it's not the molecule that we're responding to, it's the sweetness, the sensation of sweetness that we're responding to. The sweetness switches something on in our brain that makes us want the substance. Why would that be? Well, when we evolved, we evolved in parts of the planet where food was difficult to come by. And if you could find a source of sugar, you were sorted, you had a lot of energy. You were going to be okay for the next week. So our brain has evolved to make us want sugar and respond to sugar because it's an evolutionary need for us to find good resources of food. Actually what cocaine does is it hijacks that pathway, switches on just that bit of our brain and makes us want the cocaine as if it was sugar. If you listen to some commentary you'd think that sugar is the most evil thing in the world but we have to remember it's something we evolved to need and want. It's not inherently a bad chemical, it's just something that in the modern world, where we exercise less and we have easier access to food, we have to moderate our consumption of and combine it with exercise. It's not a chemical like cocaine that's a short circuit to brain activity. We respond to the sweetness because we're programmed to do it. And I don't think you can ever take all the sweetness out of somebody's diet because life has to be enjoyable as well as healthy. I think there's plenty more about chocolate though that makes it addictive than just the chemistry. From a very young age we give children chocolate as a treat. We have positive associations with happy memories, with good times. The way that chocolate melts in your mouth is a unique mouthfeel experience. There's nothing quite like it in food. The way the fat spreads across your tongue and carries the flavour molecules all over your mouth is unique. You get an instant feeling of chocolate and associate that with the pleasurable experience of being given a treat. And I think the psychological addictive power of chocolate is probably even stronger than the chemical one. However, that melting of chocolate does open up one other little thing that's very interesting about chocolate. It's well known that a drug can be taken up through the oral cavities of the mouth or the nose through the so-called mucous membranes. And we just said that there is phenylethylamine in chocolate. And we just said that if it's eaten, it gets metabolized by the liver. So it never gets to your brain. What about if as the chocolate melts in your mouth, Part of that phenylethylamine is carried through the mucous membranes directly into the bloodstream and directly to the brain. Perhaps there is a tiny amount of that active component that is also responsible for some of the activity of chocolate. It is interesting to think that in their creation of alternative products to alcohol, the Quakers and the chocolate making companies produced a product which has components which affect your body just like alcohol. I think the good thing about chocolate is it certainly doesn't intoxicate you like alcohol does and that's what the Quakers would still have liked about it. But is it drug-like in its behaviour? I think you can make some case that it has some drug-like characteristics and that it does affect the chemistry of the brain and the mood of the person. But then almost all food products and drink products do affect the chemistry of your brain. It doesn't mean those things are inherently bad if something happens in the brain because of them. There is just one thing 
I would like to say to Nestle. Roundtrees were famous for their social liberalism. They set up a model village. The Roundtree Trust still does amazing work on liberalism and equality. Roundtree was fascinated by poverty within the city of York and did many things to try and alleviate poverty. Nestle, I'm not convinced they have the same profile. I think there's a real opportunity there for them to do more philanthropic work. And if there was one place they could start working towards equality, it would be with the chocolate bar which is actually named after our city, the Yorkie. The Yorkie which is marketed as not for girls because it's a chunky, man-sized chocolate bar. I understand that this is a marketing gimmick. I understand what you're trying to put across, that this is a big, chunky chocolate bar. But in this day and age, to advertise something as being not for women, come on. We've moved beyond this. Here at York, in the chemistry department and the other science departments, we take great efforts through the Athena Swan program to make science accessible to women, to promote women in science, to give them every opportunity to succeed. We can't carry on sending messages out that certain things are for girls and certain things are for boys. And for something branded with the name of York, perhaps that's something we could change.